over the last 25 years, there has been a decline in the church in the country, in the United States, a de-churching, people leaving the church, to the tune of over the last 25 years, 40 million adults have left the church. what I love is that if you will put something to some cool music, it will make it sound great. You know, if I just came out here and just said that, you'd be like, oh yeah, but with that music, didn't that sound dramatic? Thank you, Liv you. Uh, if you didn't, if you weren't here last week, you didn't hear that, but that's a quote, actually, audio recording of part of the message last week as we started the series talking about Christianity in crisis in our country. Uh, we've been talking a little bit uh, just about what, what uh, we're seeing happen in this nation. And it's, it's really alarming. Uh, it's something we really need to, to know about and pay attention to in the church. Uh, kind of part of the, the, the research that came out of it came from this, uh, this book called The Great De-Churching. And we can put, a, put a, uh, the, the, the image of the book up there on the screen. You can look at that. But the authors of this book did the largest research study ever in this country. And they found that over the last 25 years, 40 million Christian church-going people stopped going to church. They're now part of the group called the D-Church. They've left the church. Uh, and they're, and they're, the, the number of people, that 40 million number, is larger than all of the great spiritual awakenings in this country's history. The first, the second great awakening, and all the people who came to Christ during the Billy Graham Crusades combined. 16% of the U.S. population has stopped going to church, and this is the single greatest spiritual decline ever in the history of the church. This is kind of like the definition of a crisis when you start thinking about the church in this country. And so the, you know, the idea behind the research was to, to ask these millions and millions of Americans, why did you leave the church, and try to understand what's going on there, and then also to ask, you know, like, is there any good news in all of this? And the good news that they discovered is, is that 51% of people who've left, those 40 million, that there's something like 20-something million of those who say they'd like to come back to church. If, uh, they, if they could find a place that they could belong, their greatest need is a sense of, a felt need is a sense of belonging. And if we would invite them into our lives, invite them into our church, if they could find a pastor they liked, a church they liked, a community they liked, they said that they would like to come back. But what, what they did when they looked at these numbers is they found something really interesting. Is that a lot of people who go to church think people have left the church because they left the faith or they left Jesus or they don't like the Bible anymore or something. But actually the problem is not an outside problem. It's not the culture. It's not the secularism of the society. It's actually these people are leaving the church because of an inside problem. That they're finding the church not to be like the Jesus they read about in Scripture. That people who call themselves Christians don't look like Christ. It's kind of like what Gandhi said. I like your Christ, but not your Christians, because your Christians don't look like your Christ. Uh, it is this famous quote of Brennan Manning that made its way into a, a really famous DC talk song uh, years ago. It says, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christian." I mean, that is an astounding statement, isn't it? That the reason people leave faith is because of Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips but walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. This is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. What, what Manning is trying to get at is that, is that what we know from the Bible, what we know from life, is that people like Jesus. But people who are not like Jesus, but call themselves followers of Jesus, are pushing people away from Jesus. Over the next few weeks, I want us to talk about some of these I don't want to be's. And we're going to start today with a message called, I don't want to be a Pharisee. Because when we read in the New Testament, we discover that the people who did this the best, or you might say the worst, were the people inside of the religion of Judaism called the Pharisees. They are the people who stand in the way of Jesus, and they stand in the way of others following Jesus. But what's interesting is it's not because they're secular or sinful in the way that we think of it, 
but they're actually religious, but they're not really what Jesus or what God has always been looking for. They are what the Bible calls Pharisees. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a Pharisee. There's a song years ago that says, I just want to be a sheep, ba 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 ba. I don't want to be a Pharisee, right? I, I don't want to be a goat, nope, right? I, I, I don't want to be a goat. A goat doesn't have any hope. Cause they're, and I don't want to be a hypocrite, because they're not hip to it. I don't want to be a Pharisee, because they're not fair, you see. Somebody else wrote a song that goes like this, I don't want to be a Pharisee or anyone like that. It's stupid swallowing camels while straining out a gnat. To keep the letter of the law, they forgot the people it was for. So I don't want to be a Pharisee. I don't want to be a Pharisee. I don't want to be a Pharisee or anyone like that. I don't want to be a Pharisee. Pharisees were the people who kept people from coming to Jesus. The Pharisees were the ones that were trying to stop Jesus from letting people who wanted to come to God come to him. Now, if you want to learn a little bit about Pharisees in the Bible, maybe the best chapter is the 23rd chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. I'm not going to read the whole chapter today, but you might want to go home and just read it because Jesus offers an enormous amount of information about them in that chapter. Um, he, he, ad he addresses them as the ones who sit in Moses' seat, meaning they're just, just judging everyone, like, oh, you're doing this wrong and you're doing that wrong. He says that they preach, but they don't practice what they preach, which is really interesting, right? They're telling everybody else to do it. He says that they put burdens on people's shoulders, but they're not willing to even lift a finger to help people. Jesus says that everything they do is just for people to see. It's not really substantive. to the, It's not on an authentic faith. It's just a showy faith. Jesus talks about how they like to wear phylacteries, I don't know if you've ever read this in the Bible or not, but phylacteries are the things that Orthodox Jews today wear on their, on their arms. They're like little boxes that contain the Bible, and then they'll wear them around their forehead. But back in those days, there was a competition to who, who could have the biggest phylactery. Like, I'm going to have, like, I'm not just going to have, like, a Bible. I'm going to have the biggest one I can put on my forehead. I want everybody to see I'm the most religious. It's like a person who's like, I'm going to be a Christian. I'm going to get a cross, but I'm going to get the biggest cross. Then people are going to really think that I love Jesus. But this is all done for a show. Jesus says they love to be honored in banquets, to be called by great names. They want people to revere them and talk about how religious and good they are. But Jesus offers his harshest, sternest, and most critical rebuke of these Pharisees. He actually says that they are leading people not to God, but they are leading people, quote unquote, to Gehenna, to hell. And they're blind guides. If you follow them, you're going to be following them right into the same place that they are going. Seven woes Jesus offers against them in Matthew 23. Today I want us to just look at one of those and let that be the text that sets the tone of this message today. In Matthew 23, verse 13, Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law. In the original language, grammatus, we get the word grammatic from that. They're scribes. They pay attention to every little letter, every little word of the law. You, and Pharisees. The Pharisees was this Jewish group. Josephus, the Jewish historian, says there were 6,000 of them. They were super dedicated and super pious. But the problem is, Jesus says, you guys are hypocrites. I always try to explain the meaning of the word hypocrite because in Greek, the word hypocrite is hypocrite. Hypocrites. Hupa means means like like the it's a, it's a preposition meaning kind of a, a, like above or around. Crite is the word critical, it's judgment, and it means like a superficial judgment. It means a surface level judgment. It means that they are projecting themselves as one thing, but when you look beneath the surface, there's something different. They're not real in their faith. They're not like really living this thing out. There's just a show. Jesus says, you guys are hypocrites. You judge, uh, you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. Like you're keeping people away from God. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those who enter who are trying. The Pharisees were the people who were keeping people from following Jesus. One of the concerns that I have for what I see in the research about Christ, the crisis of Christianity in our culture today and in the church 
is that I think we have a crisis of Phariseeism. We have a lot of people who have a lot of religion, and they want to show everybody the size of their Bible or, their, or how spiritual they are. But are they authentically following Christ in their life, and are they drawing people to Jesus? Are, are they, do they look like Jesus? Do they sound like Jesus? Because what Jesus is saying in this verse is, we don't shut the door to the kingdom. We need to open the door to the kingdom. One of the most important things that we as Christians can do and churches can do is to open the door. Not just like physically, but like say to the world around us, we want you here. Like we want to we open the door for you and invite you to come in. We want you to share in the good news. We want you to share in what's happening. I've been the pastor here for 11 and a half years. I have preached the same sermon 52 times a year for the last 11 and a half years. And it has been a message that keeps saying over and over, the church has got to open the door. We have got to be a people who are known for welcoming people to Jesus. And the church itself needs to be a welcoming church. A few years ago, Tom Rainer, well-known author, released a book on the welcoming church. And in promotion of that book, he created this video. I'd like for us to watch it. Thank you. Hi there. Welcome to your church. Today, I'd like to talk with you about becoming a more welcoming church. Back here, we've got Jack and Sally and little Jack Jack, and they're first time guests today. Hi. You guys ready? We've got a bit of a hike. Let's do it, please. Most church members don't see their churches clearly. They think of their churches as friendly, open, welcoming. But when guests were surveyed, they typically saw church members as unfriendly, and they certainly didn't feel welcomed. Hello. The perception chasm existed because church members were indeed friendly to one another. Guests felt like they were crashing a private party. Should we get Jack Jack checked in? For instance, while you feel your church is homey and everyone knows each other, without clear security safeguards, guests may find those same areas creepy, or worse yet, unsafe. Nope. See you in worship. The problem is church isn't the country club. It's a place for broken people to come together and become a family. <clears throat> Sermon starting. You know, I wish there was a longer uh, video there just to kind of show, because it, what it's doing is it's setting the stage for us, right, to talk about the experience that people have, the real experience they have from the moment they come onto the parking lot to the moment they come into the building. One of the things that we want to be is a welcoming church, right? But this is also a larger, this sets a larger tone for the, for the whole idea of being Christianity and the church in general as being a welcoming people. And what we have to remember is that when Jesus arrived on the scene in the first century, God wanted, always wanted his people to be like that. Go read the Old Testament. He says he's called his people to be a light unto all the nations, that he blessed Abraham to bless all the nations. God's always wanted his people to be a people who are welcoming all the people to him. But they actually became the opposite of that, and they became a rigid and closed off kind of people. Now, one of the ways that we see that is with the Pharisees and the Jews in the, in the New Testament, but we even see it in the lives of Jesus' followers, his most devout followers, including Simon Peter himself. You know, Peter was a man who, who bragged about how much he, he loved Jesus and would follow Jesus, but Peter was not very much like Jesus in his attitude toward people who were not Jews. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, an incredibly important moment in the book of Acts that captures a, a turning point in the history of Christianity. Uh, the, the picture we can put here on the screen of, of Peter's vision, you know, this comes like right out of a children's book. If, and and I, I wanted to show you that just in case you like know this story, it kind of maybe it brings to your mind, but Peter has a vision one day. Now this, this story, which is in Acts 10, uh, happens in two different locations. 
both are along the shore of the Mediterranean Sea. Today in the news, we hear about Gaza. If you just go north of Gaza along the Mediterranean, you get to a city called Joppa or Jaffa. And that's where Simon Peter will spend the night. You go a little bit further north, about 60 kilometers, and you, and you come to a city in those days called Caesarea Maritima. It was a Roman capital city built on the edge of the Mediterranean. It was where Pontius Pilate had his headquarters. It was an important place, and there were a lot of important Roman soldiers who lived there. That sets the stage for the story that, we, that we're going to read in just a moment. Because there in Caesarea, a Roman, a, a Gentile, a person who was not allowed to be a part of the Jewish faith and tradition, was seeking God in his life. He was praying to God, and, and, he was, and he was trying to learn about what it meant to follow God, but he was not accepted by the Jewish people. He was not accepted by the followers of Jesus until what happens in Acts chapter 10. I want to pick up in verse 1. It says in, in Acts 10 verse 1, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius. He was a centurion. Now, if you don't know that, the, we get our word century from that because it's the word hundred. He was a Roman soldier in charge of a, of a, of a group of about a hundred soldiers. He had a very important job. It was, uh, he was well-trained and educated. Uh, he was a higher class for that, for that job. He was higher paid for that job. He was a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and his family were devout and God-fearing. That's like really incredible because if you know anything about the Roman, uh, the Roman military, you couldn't be a Jew and join the Roman military. Jews weren't allowed to associate with Gentiles, eat with Gentiles, be in the homes of Gentiles. And the Romans were well known for like having like worship of their gods as a part of their Roman military service. So it's really incredible what we see there about this guy. He and his family were devout and God-fearing, and he gave generously to those in need, and he prayed to God regularly. So it's painting the picture of a Gentile guy who is seeking God in his life. Well, one day, about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. And he distinctively saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa, or Jaffa, to bring back a man named Simon who was called Peter. This sets the stage for what happens. The soldiers set out to go and find Peter. Now what Peter has done is he's come to Joppa, or Jaffa, this port city. He's come to the house of a man named Simon the Tanner, and they're making lunch. It's, it's noon. And what Peter does is he goes up on the roof of the house. The homes there are flat on the top, and then you often go up there to pray, or in the evenings you'd go out there because it was just cooler. And Peter goes up there at noon to pray, and while he's praying, he has a vision. And the vision is the thing that we just talked about and showed you that picture of. But I want to read to you what happens in verse 9. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey approaching the city, the Roman soldiers are coming to you know, find Peter. Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry. You know, you ever smell food while it's cooking and you're just, oh man, I'm, I was hungry right now, I'm really hungry. And he became hungry and guess what he's going to do? He's going to dream about food, right? He became hungry and he wanted something to eat and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. If you don't know it, it, go read Leviticus of the Old Testament. The Jews were not allowed to eat these animals. They were forbidden. They were considered, quote-unquote, unclean. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Now, this is the voice of God speaking to Peter. And listen to what Peter says, surely not Lord. Basically like, no way, God. I mean, that's incredible, isn't it? God is speaking into Peter's life, and Peter's like, no, God, I'm not going to do that, because why? Because God told me not to. It's like God's telling you to, right? And Peter replied, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. 
In fact, this experience for Peter doesn't happen once or twice. It happens three times. It takes Peter that much to finally understand that God is doing something in the life of this, of this Gentile named Cornelius. So finally he gets up and he goes. He travels the journey. They get to the house of Cornelius. He walks into the home and he likes like, you know, I've never been into a Gentile's house. I never go into a Gentile's house. I, it's not something I do. I don't have anything to do with Gen. And then the Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius when Peter shares with him about Jesus. He's like, I was a follower of Jesus, and this is what happened, this is what happened, and this is what happened. And Cornelius experiences the Holy Spirit. The divine presence of God comes into the life of this Gentile. And Peter says, you know what? I cannot continue to say I cannot continue to say that these people are unclean. I cannot continue to say that I, those people are not going to be welcomed into the church or welcomed into the presence of God because God is at work in their lives. Peter's like, I've got to stop being the one at the door saying, no, you're a Gentile, you can't come in here. And this moment changes history. It changes the New Testament. It changes the fact that you and I are here today. And what happens in Caesarea begins to happen in another little place called Antioch of Syria. And Paul goes there and others. And all these Gentiles begin to become believers. And then from Syrian Antioch, there's the first time people are called Christians. And from that city, they will travel in his first missionary journey. Paul and Barnabas is second and his third. And the whole world will hear about the good news of Jesus. That God has opened the door that Gentiles can come in. Who was standing in the way, though, of them coming in to begin with? It was these Jewish people. It was these pharisaical minds. It was these minds that said, no, we don't let those people in. And God's message to them is, don't call what is unclean what I have made clean. In Acts chapter 10, Peter has this, uh, this moment of realization when this happens. Uh, and, 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 he, and, and suddenly he's, he sees really for the first time like what's going on when he says, you know, that he, that he won't eat anything unclean. He says this is in Acts chapter 10, verse 34. I just wanted to read it. He says, now I realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but he accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Throughout the New Testament, there's this idea of favoritism, this idea of judgmentalism. This idea of looking at people and putting them into different groups and measuring them based on external, you know, definitions. Well, one of the things that we see as a problem in our culture with people leaving the church and not wanting to come back is because they don't feel like the door is open or this is what their number one fear is, is that when they walk into the door, they're not worried about being judged by our culture, but they are wondering and worried how they're going to be judged by other Christians. And so the second thing we need to do today is we need less judgmentalism. We need less judgmentalism. If you look at the attitude or the sentiment of the Pharisees toward unbelievers, there's stories in the Bible about how a Pharisee will go and they'll pray and they'll look over there and there's a sinner praying and they'll be like, thank you God that I'm not like that horrible sinner over there. But the truth is, we're all sinners. The truth is, is that none of us are better than anyone else. Because God actually doesn't show favoritism. I don't care how good you are, how religious you are, how spiritual you are, how often you go to church, how big your cross is or your Bible is. God does not look upon you with greater favor than he does on the person who is lost and in need of Jesus. And the fact that, that we even would think that is revealing something about ourselves. You know, one of the conversations that I have with people all the time who have left church and is a pastor, people are like, oh, you're a pastor? Let me tell you my story. Let me tell you my story. And, and I never hear someone say, I don't like Jesus. I've never heard someone say, I don't believe in the Bible. But I have heard people say to me again and again and again, I met somebody at church and I will never go back there again. What they said, what they did. 
you know, I don't know about you, but I feel like as a Christian coming to church, I never get that much judgment out there. But I face plenty of it in here. And some of you in this room would go, I've had the same experience. But if there is one place on earth where there should, it should be a judgment-free zone, it's in a place where people who come know that they didn't get here by their good works or their good deeds. But we got here simply by the good grace of a good and loving God. We did a whole series a few weeks ago on human connection and connection with God. And one of the quotes that we said in that series is that connection happens in places where there is no judgment. Judgment-free zones. Well, the church should be a place that is judgment-free. In the book of Romans, which is Paul's magnum opus, his great work, the height of the 16th chapter of the book of Romans is chapter 8. And the, book, the chapter, uh, chapter 8 starts with these words. This is the first verse of the mountaintop of Paul's greatest letter. Therefore... There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the spirit of Christ has set you free from the spirit of the law. There's no condemnation. The seventh chapter, Paul's like, hey, why do I do the things I don't want to do? But chapter eight starts by saying that in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation. There's no, there's no judgment. God did not come send Jesus into this world to judge us. Jesus was not judgmental. And if we're going to be like Jesus, we've got to be less judgmental. In John chapter 3, verse 16, perhaps the most famous verse in the Bible, God says, or Scripture says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And everyone's like, yeah, amen, that's right, I love that verse. But do we keep reading where it says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Wait a minute, that must be like a typo. You know, get a different translation or something, right? God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world? That's right, it says, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. In other words, if we're walking around and judging each other or we're judging other people, we're not doing the Lord's work. Because in Jesus, there is no condemnation. In fact, the decision about whether you're in, you have life, or you don't have life is not based on what you do. It's who you believe in. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. You know, one of the most famous Southern Baptist preachers was Charles Stanley. He died, you know, this last year or so. His son Andy started a, a church that has become one of the most successful churches in this country at helping people who are de-churched come back to church. And one of the things that Andy has tried to deal with as a pastor is the mindset of people in the church versus people outside the church. He's, he made this statement, we put it here on the screen, Christians are viewed in this culture as being judgmental, homophobic, moralists who think they are the only ones going to heaven and who secretly relish the fact that everyone else is going to hell. That's an absolutely incredible statement. I mean, in fact, you read it, some of you are kind of like pushing back, like, oh, no, no, not really, not really. This is how Christians are viewed in the culture. Now, you think about Jesus, how is Jesus viewed in culture, like in the first century? He's viewed very well. But it's also the second half of this verse that really concerns me when he says they secretly relish the fact that everyone else is going to hell. Like, like I'm going, but I don't care about anybody else. When I hear that definition of Christians, I think Pharisees. Because in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus told us that is the way the Pharisee thought and acted. They had punched their ticket and they were going to glory, and so they thought. But in reality, Jesus said they were on a path leading to hell and they were bringing everybody else with them. And what they were actually doing is keeping everyone who really wanted to come into the kingdom out. 
by creating all of these false rules and regulations, and you got to do this, and you got to jump like this, and you got to follow this rule that's not even in the scriptures. And while they're busy judging everybody else, they themselves on the inside, Jesus says they're like whitewashed tombs. In the land of Israel, when a person was buried, they were buried twice. You were buried, first of all, you were put into what they call an, an ossuary, a bone. Uh, well, you were buried first, and then you were put into an ossuary, a bone box. And bone boxes were beautiful and ornate. And if you were to look at those whitewashed tombs, you would go, gosh, that's beautiful. I'd love that furniture in my, in my living room. And Jesus is like, hey, all these people just love their tombs. They, 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 they love their caskets, but they forget that inside it's just dead. And you know what he says? You know what? That is the character of many people's lives who call themselves the Pharisees or the followers of God. That like on the outside, it looks pretty good, but on the inside, they're spiritually dead disconnected and inauthentic in their followership of God. We need less judgmentalism. Or to put it another way, we need to rebrand ourselves. You see, Christians have not just a problem in this culture of not being like Jesus, but we've earned a reputation of not being like Jesus. We are perceived in our society not as people who are the salt and light of the world. We are perceived of as people who are narrow-minded and judgmental. And we need to be branded in culture along the, along the same line as Jesus was. Jeff Jones, who pastors Chase Oaks Church up in Plano, got to be there a few weeks ago. and He's just written this new book called Rebranding Christianity. And in the book, he makes this quote. Christianity is perhaps the most powerful brand in the world. It offers the biggest and best promise ever made of God's unconditional love and salvation. That's like what Jesus did. It's great. The gospel is great. Christianity is great. Jesus is great. The problem is, is the culture looks at us as Christians so many times in churches, and you know what they see? Judgmentalism and hypocrisy. You see, a culture of Phariseeism, people more concerned about following some rules or trying to make themselves look a certain way than authentically living out what Jesus did best. Which, remember, Jesus attracted sinners to himself. Jesus did not say, by this all men will know you're my disciples. If you're religious, if you're Baptist, if you, 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 know, if you, have a really, if you do the certain religious things, this is what Jesus said when he washed the feet of his disciples in John chapter 13 on, on Monday, Thursday. In verse 34, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this Everyone will know you're my disciples if you love one another. Jesus said the brand of Christianity that he's starting is a brand that is known by how much you love each other. You know, a few years ago, Domino's was doing a really bad job with their pizzas. Do you remember this? You'd order a Domino's and you'd eat it and you'd go, this is gross. Domino's realized it and they made an advertisement about it, you know, in which they said, our pizzas taste like cardboard. And they were honest about the fact that their pizzas taste terrible. And they rebranded themselves. They changed the recipe. Well, what we need to do as Christians in this culture that is in crisis, where Christian people are leaving the church, is we need to rebrand ourselves as Christians under the brand of Jesus. <laughs> who said, by this all people will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Christians should be known for their love. It should be what everybody talks about, the people in that church. Man, they just love one another. The love is the most important thing to them. In this 23rd chapter of Matthew, when Jesus goes through the list of all his criticisms of the Pharisees, one of the things he says that they're really good at He's like, hey, guys, y'all follow some of the laws really carefully, but you know what you neglect is the more important parts of the law, like mercy and justice and faithfulness. Like you follow some of the rules, you follow the ones you want to follow, but you ignore the ones that really matter most, how you treat one another, how you love one another. Last time I quoted from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians in which he just, he just brags about those Christians. I want to read the full verse this time because I only gave you a snippet last. 
1 Thessalonians 4, 9, he says, now about your love for one another, we don't need to write to you. You yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. In Greek, it's just one word, God taught. You've been God taught. You've been God taught to love one another. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, do so more and more. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business. Hello, folks. There's no place for judgmentalism in the church of God. Mind your own business is what his message is. Work with your hands as we told you. And now why is he saying this? So that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders. Last time I talked about us winning people to Jesus. How we're gonna win people to Jesus is not because we got a really good argument, not because we, we, we understand the Bible really well. People don't care what we know until they know how much we care. We've gotta love people into the kingdom. He says, so you won't be dependent on anybody. Your daily life, the life of loving one another well, wins a world that is longing to belong and is looking for something real and authentic. Historians have tried to figure out something that's really bothered them for years. Like how did Christianity go from like this little tiny religion into becoming the most dominant religion in the world in the first few centuries? They had no power, they had no money, they had no influence in government. How did it happen? And historians have, have come away with an amazing conclusion that what happened that caused Christianity to grow was that everyday ordinary Christians were simply loving their neighbors. It's true, this is a historical fact that when plagues came on the Roman Empire, when famines broke out, when there was, when there was need or hurt, it was the Christians who showed up. Their reputation in society was they were salt and light. People wanted to become Christians because they could tell how much they cared. I don't know about you, but I'm drawn to people who care and love me. Well, our world is longing for a place to belong and for people who will care about them. I said this last time. It's the Amish saying, you know, you ask an Amish man, are you a Christian? And he'll always say, Ask my neighbor. And I wonder today, if we were to ask your neighbor, what would they say about your Christianity? Do we see your love for one another? I want to finish by giving you this quote again from Brennan Manning. I want neither a blood and guts religion that would make Clint Eastwood not Jesus our hero, nor a speculative religion that would imprison the gospel in the halls of academia, nor a noisy feel-good religion that is a naked appeal to emotion. I long for passion, intelligence, and compassion in a church without ostentation, gently beckoning to the world to come and enjoy the peace and unity we possess because the Spirit is in our midst. That's what Cornelius experienced. It's what those disciples in the upper room with Jesus experienced. And it's what our world around us is desperately longing to find. And my prayer is, they'll find it here in us. Would you join me as we pray? Father, we just want to take this moment at the end of this message to ask you to take the truth of this message and make it a part of our lives. God, there's maybe some of us in this room that the truth is, we're a little bit more like the Pharisee than we are like Jesus. We're a little bit more like the person who is good at following the rules or can, trying to convince other people that we're really following Jesus. But people can see through the veneer. They can feel it because they just don't feel love around us. And God, I just pray that your spirit would just break our hearts today, shape us, reshape us, push us, reform us into a people that this world desperately needs. A people who look like Jesus. Lord, to look like Jesus doesn't mean we dress like Jesus. It doesn't mean we talk like Jesus. It means that we love like Jesus. 
by this, Lord, all people will know by our love. May that love be shed abroad in our hearts as it was at the cross. When you loved us so much while we were sinners, you died for us. But you look past all the wrongs of our life. And still today, Lord, your no finger is pointed at the imperfections of our heart or the misdeeds of our past. But you are a loving God with arms reaching out toward us and to the world around us. And you're saying you're welcome. You're welcome into my presence. My grace is enough for you. Come home in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand together? We're going to sing and worship. If God's speaking to your heart today to make any kind of decision with us to pray, our prayer team will be up here at the front. We encourage you to move in the, as we worship together. If you're not comfortable coming forward, I'll be out here in the hallway after what works. I'd love to share and talk with you. As God is moving here in this place, I pray that you'll be faithful to whatever it is he asks you to do.